Hi, I'm Professor Harry Porter of Portland State University. In this series of videos, I will describe cache memory and I'll introduce some of the basic concepts and terms and explain how they work. You've heard about L1 and L2 and L3 caches. After these videos, you'll understand what these terms mean. I'll talk about cache lines and cache blocks. We'll discuss what it means to be a cache hit or cache miss. I'll describe the principle of locality and tell you what a working set is and how it relates to caches. We'll talk about loop strides. Uh, we'll talk about cache coherency. And I'll explain how associative caches work as well as direct map caches. And then I'll put it all together and describe how modern caches work today. Here is the basic block diagram for any computer. On the left-hand side, you see the central processing unit. And over here you see the main memory. From time to time the CPU needs data out of the memory, so it sends an address to the main memory, and the memory sends the data back. And periodically the CPU will want to update memory. It will do writes to memory as well as reads, and when it does a write it will send an address to the main memory as well as data to the main memory. Unfortunately, memory is relatively slow. And this is where cache comes into play. So the main idea of a cache memory is that it sits between the CPU and the main memory. The main memory is much larger than the cache memory, and it's also much slower than the cache memory. So the idea is that the cache can speed things up. The CPU, when it wants to do a read from memory, will send an address out, just like above in this diagram here, but that address will be intercepted by the cache. If the data the CPU is looking for happens to be in the cache, then the cache can return it immediately and quickly. If the data that the CPU is looking for is not in the cache, then the cache will go ahead and forward the address to the main memory. The main memory will then send the data to the cache, and the cache will forward it to the CPU. Now in this picture, notice that from the CPU's point of view, it looks exactly the same whether there's a cache there or there's not. In both cases, the uh, CPU sends an address to the memory when it wants to read or write, and it either gets data back or it sends data to the memory. And it also looks the same from the memory's point of view. Okay, The memory is getting an address and in the case of a read operation, it sends the data back. So cache can be added to the system and it's somewhat transparent. So the CPU doesn't really have to be changed and the main memory doesn't have to be changed. The cache is interposed and basically it speeds the whole operation up. The main idea behind cache memory is that some data is important and it's frequently used and it's critical that it be served to the CPU quickly. However, most data is not. Most data is not needed very often and it's not nearly as critical. So the idea is that we keep the important data in the cache and that way we can give it to the CPU much faster. There is faster access to the data that's more frequently used if we're able to keep that data in the cache. The less important data is still accessible, but it's stored in a much larger, much slower, and much cheaper memory. Caching is a very general concept. It can be used in a variety of contexts, and I've shown some of them here. Oftentimes when we talk about cache, we're talking about the cache that sits between the CPU and main memory. So this is traditionally what the cache is and what the word cache means. But we can have caches in other contexts as well. For example, uh, we can put a cache in front of the disk memory or the flash uh, memory. It sits between the computer itself, uh, and the CPU and the memory, and the non-volatile storage. So with caching main memory, uh, typically we uh, 
will read in chunks of main memory. We call these chunks blocks, and they're typically 64 bytes or something of that order. And so the cache is full of a number of blocks. Each block is 64 bytes, and from time to time it provides those blocks to the CPU. When we're caching pieces of the disk or the flash drive, then we're doing exactly the same thing, although the block size is much larger. In the case of uh, caching disk or flash data, we typically call the, the, the items that we cache pages, but we also call them blocks from time to time. And they are pieces of files or pieces of virtual memory address spaces. And the size of a page that's cached here is usually quite a bit larger and it's typically four kilobytes. Another application of the general idea of caching happens in your browser. Okay, so when you use your browser to look at some web page, uh, you have to go out to the internet to get that web page, and that's a slow process. And so once the web page is retrieved, it's kept into it's kept in a cache inside the browser, and the browser can refer to that page very quickly. It doesn't have to constantly go back to the internet to get that page. It caches it. Another example is uh, also caching web pages, but here the idea is that uh, your laptop is uh, trying to get some web pages from a, a distant server that's perhaps on another continent, and so the communication time to this server on some other continent is really quite slow. So there are web servers that are on the internet but they're much closer to you, maybe in the same city or, or maybe in the same region, certainly not on another continent. And those web servers will have copies of the web pages from the distant server. So when your computer asks for a web page, it goes out to the internet, but it doesn't go all the way to another continent. It just goes to the nearest server that happens to have that web page cached. In all of these cases, you see what's happening is the same. The main storage is slow, and the cache is a way to effectively speed that up. So we keep more commonly used data in the cache, and then that cache can provide that data to the client much more quickly. So we have the general concept of caching, which is applied to lots of different domains, and we have the more specific concept of caching that's applied to caching main memory uh, by the CPU core. So typically, this sort of a cache, and this is what we refer to when we hear the terms L1, L2, and L3, these caches are located on the CPU chip itself. So the unit that we're caching is usually a very small number of bytes, and it's uh, oftentimes 64 bytes. So this is the block size, 64 bytes. The cache sits between a processing unit, that is a CPU core, and the main memory. And typically the main memory is much larger uh, perhaps uh, one gigabyte. Now, the cache itself is a lot larger than 64 bytes. It might be, for example, 32 kilobytes or even 8 megabytes, uh, but it's still a lot smaller than the one gigabyte main memory. These caches are located on the processor chip, so in a multi-core processor where you have perhaps four cores, you would have the cache sitting on the same chip as the four cores. Main memory is typically implemented with dynamic random access memory, which is cheaper um, and smaller than static RAM. Cache memory is generally implemented with static RAM, which is much faster. Uh, it takes more transistors per bit, so it's larger, um, and therefore more expensive. So cache is small, expensive, and fast, whereas main memory is slow, cheap, and large. Here's a diagram showing the caches on the Intel Core i7 chip. 
So the dotted line here indicates what's on the main chip. And so you see the four cores that you would find on that chip along with a bunch of caches, L1, L2, and L3 caches. Uh, down here you have the main memory, which is not on the chip. It's in, on some other chip or chips. So the cores have their own private caches. The L1 and L2 caches are private to a particular core, whereas the L3 cache is shared among all of the cores. When a CPU core wants to fetch data, it is either fetching instructions that it intends to execute in the near future, or it's fetching data that it intends to operate on. And so the instruction stream is a little bit different than the data stream of data. Um, so there is a separate cache for the instructions as, and the data. Uh, the instruction cache uh, doesn't have to worry about updates because the CPU core doesn't modify instructions, whereas the data cache has to deal with writes, and that can make things a little bit more complex and difficult. Both of those uh, get their data from the L2 cache, and that in turn gets its data from the L3 cache, and that from the main memory. So. The L1 caches are small but super fast. The L2 caches are larger but not quite as fast. The L3 cache is much larger yet and slower still. And then finally the main memory is even bigger and slower. Here are some numbers to put this into perspective. Uh, for the Intel chip, uh, the L1 caches are 32 kilobytes in size. And so you can see they're smaller than the L2 caches, which are 256 kilobytes. And the L3 cache is even larger at 8 megabytes. Uh, and then you can compare that to main memory, which might be uh, 16 gigabytes, for example. Also, the L1 cache is much faster. Okay, you're looking at four clock cycles. L2 caches are slower, so you're seeing uh, maybe uh, uh, two to three times slower. And the L3 cache is even slower than that, maybe another three to uh, three times slower. And then main memory is even slower than that. In the next uh, video, we'll get into some of the basic concepts and talk a little bit more in detail about how caches actually work.